Uh, so, hello Akash. Uh, so, myself, uh, Patnik Priya. So, I work as a senior uh, five to six years of experience. Uh, uh, so, maybe let's start with your uh, brief introduction and uh, your work. Yeah, so, uh, like I completed my graduation in 2018 in computer science engineering. And since then, only I have been in the data engine space for around five and a half years. So, I worked on the technologies like uh, Patch and Hi-Fi, IcePark, uh, Hadoop Stack like the HDFS, Spark, uh, for the for the monitoring of events, uh, I worked on ELK stack, the Elasticsearch. And lately in my career, I also had the opportunity to work on the tech, uh, Azure technologies like Azure Databricks, uh, Azure Data Factory, Azure Data Lake Storage. So yeah, I worked on these technologies and yeah, uh, solved various uh, business problems uh, throughout, uh, throughout my career using using these tech stack. Yeah, so okay. Uh can you maybe uh, go a little deep into your recent project? Like, uh, I mean, what is the challenge you have like faced? Like, what is the uh, problem statement? Yeah. So in in our recent project, uh, we are kind of acting as a middleware between various customers and vendors. So from various customers, we receive various kind of uh, data, uh, like different unstructured data, and from various different sources. And our task is to so the main problem here is to gather all all these kind of data and send it to the respective vendors. Since both uh, the systems of customers and vendors are of different types, both ex accept different kinds of data. So main challenge is to transfer the data from one source to another one. Uh, so that problem we solve. Along with that, uh, since we have this huge data flowing from various uh, teams, we store all of them to the data lake. And uh, uh, there is one more problem which we solve. So our task is also to gain insights from the data so that the customers or the vendors can make use of that data uh, to build the analytics platforms or to build the build the models on the top of those data. Uh, so, so basically like yeah, solving solving these problems, uh, data related problems, either for getting all kind of data from various sources, uh, various customers, or uh, helping them to gain, get insights out of those that raw data. So when you say various data sources, uh, what kind of data sources you have been dealing with? So like these are RDBMS, uh, SFTPs, um, in many cases it's uh, APIs as well. So we call the API for various customers to get the data. Uh, there, there are some fixed file formats which is placed in the SFTPs of various customers uh, from the, the on-premise, on in their on-premise systems. So yeah, we have uh, dealt with these uh, data sources. Okay, uh, so yeah. when you say like different customers and different data sources, do you have uh, one automated pipelines to have your data like read or like it's uh, different for different customers? Like how are you? Yeah, so we have uh, we have built one automated pipelines to to read data. Uh, of course, if a new data source comes which is not aligned with that particular data pipeline, then we try to accommodate in that and accommodate in a way so that uh, it's it's more of a configuration level. Uh, where if the similar type of customers comes again, we will again uh, try to accommodate within the same pipelines. So yeah, it's mostly mostly for even if the new customer comes, um, try, we will build the pipelines in a way so that it's more on a configuration basis, and uh, and so that these can be automated. These things can be. Automated. So yeah. uh, in, in, in this project, uh, did you work on all the layers of data, like, I mean, ingestion, transformation, or like, and Correct. Like, I have, it? yeah, so I worked on ingestion, getting the data, uh, putting the data to the data lakes, which is SDFS. Uh, I also worked on, like, this is one part of it. Uh, we, along with, while putting the data to the SDFS, we also send the data to the vendors and receive the feedback from them. Like, if a purchase order is sent to, but so they send from a customer, they send it to the vendor, and then vendor will send us the PO acknowledgement. That okay, it acknowledges the PO, whatever status it is, and we will send that back to the customer. So this is one layer of transaction. Now in this process, while receiving the PO, we store it to the data lake. While receiving the PO acknowledgement, we send it to the data lake. So all kind of data which is there, we send it to the data lake. From that data lake, we built a Spark pipeline. To, to transform the data, to remove the invalidated data, or to the aggregations based on based on your part of the, that particular data, and present it back to the data lake. So the, after that, the data warehousing teams connect to the data and build the analytics platform. So our task is to gather, send it to vendors, or receive the data from the vendors, push it to 
Datalake as well. Uh, build this path address to get the data from the Datalakes and again put the aggregated data back to the HDFS. After that, the other teams, data warehousing team takes care of that. Okay, so yeah. when you say uh, you're storing in data lake or HDFS, uh, like are you storing a simple CSVs or like any particular uh, formats that supports your downstream uh, pipeline? Yeah, so it's basically we so we push the data in form of parquet. Whatever data is coming in different files, we always put it for the for the Spark pipeline to run. From like for the HDFS, we always majorly put the data in like uh, in the parquet format. Because Spark is really suitable with that parquet, eh? and uh, that's where uh, that's where all of data goes. In the downstream pipelines, they expect different kind of data. In case of some cases, there are RDBMS, so that we take care within the pipelines in the data pipeline. But for the data lake, it is uh, parquet. Only. So, like uh, before you decide on parquet, did you explore on any other file formats like ORC or Avro or any others? Uh, and like on what any any differentiation you see between them based on which uh, you have choose this one? Yeah. So basically, uh, parquet in the in the downstream we mostly read the data from the from the like sources, right? And parquet parquet is a columnar format uh, like then uh, CSV. So it really helps us uh, to read the data faster. That's one thing of, of it. And the second thing is Parquet is uh, very much, uh, you know, storage optimized as well. So there are, uh, since it stores the metadata, it, uh, it has a lot of uh, light compression techniques within build so that it compresses data. So I've seen like around uh, reducing the data to more than 50, 60%, 60, 70%, even like 1 GB file reducing to 300 MBs. So that is really helpful uh, for us while uh, while while making the storage cost. That's one thing out of it. Second thing is Park is uh, really good, like because it generally stores the metadata. So it's really good in uh, querying or uh, doing certain functions like finding the max. I mean, these kind of things are really good in Park. So yeah, that's where we use Park. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, so. As you mentioned, like about compression and uh, like the metadata about Parquet, right? So, um, in which of the Spark transformations you think we can leverage this metadata capabilities of Parquet? Like, are you doing any filtering? I mean, I'm asking with respect to your filtering, like how a Parquet format helps uh, when compared to a, maybe a row, uh, row based file format? So, it's first of all, it's really uh, like since it's a columnar format, so it's it's, even if we are if we are reading two or three columns only, uh, Parquet is really helpful as it's column format. We just need to capture that data. So while reading itself, it's very important. Second thing is like while filtering. Uh, let's say let's say we want to filter something based on like some PO values, like uh, the tenth, like some number PO value. Then uh, within Parquet, uh, the Parquet files are divided into some column chunks where the min max values of certain columns are stored. So it really helps in those queries or those filtering where we want to find the min max, especially the min max, the count of entire files, if we want to know the count. So even if there are, uh, let's say, 30 lakh, 50 lakh rows, then uh, par par while reading the park, it doesn't have to scan each and every row. It will directly give us the result. Okay. And uh, yeah. did you uh, uh, check on any specific compression format or like uh, what is the compression format you are uh, storing the files? It's mostly snippy. Uh, by default, okay. Yeah. okay. Didn't expect much. Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, one more thing is like when you said data lake, right? Like, uh, um, what, like, in, in your perspective, like, what, uh, what are the use cases and when uh, a company or a project uh, might choose to go with a data lake and not a simple uh, database or either it's SQL or NoSQL? And, Specifically, maybe you can uh, talk about your scenario as well. Uh, why did you choose to be in data lake or why not data warehouse as well? Yeah, uh, maybe you can talk a little about so, that. Yeah, since we talk like uh, there are various kinds of data with various uh, different different sources. Now, gen uh, it's, it's good like it's good to use RDBMS when we are doing the transaction process like, like a day to day transactions. In those cases, the databases are really good. Even if we use databases as a data lake, like for reading the data, it might hamper the performance on the day-to-day -day transactions. So it's always good if we are doing some kind of a reporting task or where we just need to store the data. Uh, it's quite good to use the use the data lake uh, where we are 
pushing the data to the uh, non-structured format, whatever format we want, and then later we can uh, transform it in our way. So like uh, kind of a good way to do a ELT process where we just extract it, load it with the data lake, and get it, get it from it. If we do the same thing in the data basis, it might work, but it will, uh, first of all, the databases are mostly structured, where we just would need to put the structured data in some kind of some specific formats. So that will, if we, if we apply our uh, our uh, jobs directly on the GBMS, our GBMS, then it might impact the overall the GB performance. So so it's better to use for these tasks to use the data. The data variables were also especially built, the, the concept like of patching and bucketing, the, the, these are especially built for the, analytical purposes so like uh, in case of these analytics with tools like tableau uh, it's good to connect with data warehouse rather than data lake or uh, data basis having said that we can do that we can still connect table softwares and tables with these softwares but it's always good to use uh, specific type of things so that they are they are optimized in a way yeah okay uh, so uh, as you said like once you ingest your ingest the data in the data lake you are trying to consume it uh, writing a spark job and uh, doing some processing for uh, the downstream purpose right. so to for that you have to read the data you ingested right so to right. have a, a better read or like uh, to process it uh, in a optimized way are you uh, taking any stand on uh, managing any data management strategies you're following while you are ingesting and storing uh, the parquet files in the data lake like around partitioning or any any strategies mm -hmm. on so, based mm -hmm. on your data if you want yeah to. so not while loading it initially but while we get the data from the data lake uh to writing this part of after reading it we heavily do multiple joints with multiple tables and in those cases we heavily use concepts of partitioning bucketing since we're doing joints, these kinds of concepts really help us to avoid the data shuffling for us partitions. And hence, uh, hence it's really useful to use those those strategies. So we, we try to optimize the pipelines in a way where we are, while joining, we are using the broadcast joints. While, uh, while writing it back, we do it partitioning on certain columns, like vendor names, or uh, like for uh, bucketing, like the order IDs, so that the queries are faster. Mm -hmm. So we use certain techniques uh, like these techniques while writing the data back to the data. Okay, uh, so you mean after processing the data? Yeah, after re while reading, mm -hmm. uh, during processing, we do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, you mentioned about joins right here. Yeah. So generally, uh, we talk about joins a little expensive operation in Spark, right? Right. So do you fa did you face any uh, issues around writing such complex, uh, like, transformations as such and if, if there is any like would you like to uh, discuss about that and how did you like uh, come over it like how did you resolve uh, any such issues yeah so it happened with us like uh, one of the scenarios like uh, while joining the tables initially it was good like while doing the normal joins it was good but when the data grew later this stage uh this joining took a lot of times and then we figured out that uh, okay these shuffle joins are happening across different partitions so yeah, we use certain strategies like we tried to, in, in cases where the table is very large and the second table is quite small and still by default, if this uh, broadcast gen is not happening, we used to, you know, just little bit increase the broadcast gen, either that. And if the both the tables are quite large, uh, like uh, then uh, we use uh, the SMV join, which is uh, putting the data like the uh, partitioning and the packaging and then joining it uh, to avoid the avoid the shuffling. And it increased a lot. Okay, uh, so I have a question like while ingestion process, right, in your uh, use case. So is it like you're doing it a scheduled job or it's uh, is it real time happening? Like how is it? Uh, it's it's mostly scheduled. So while ingestion, uh, it's uh, real time data. Uh, like we are uh, using using a patch and for the ingestion. So we are uh, kind of uh, uh, whenever an event triggers, whenever the file comes, it uh, it gets it. It refetches it and we put the data as to the the data lakes and the the data lake processing while reading the data from the data lake. Uh, we are it's, it's scheduled mostly. So yeah, so second part is scheduled, first part is real time. Uh, we do a similar thing in Azure Data Factory as well, where we read the data using those storage triggers and put the data to the data lake storage. So yeah, we do that as well. 
Okay. Uh, so in, in your entire uh, pipeline design of the process, right? Did you ever face a scenario of like, let's say you have processed a file and you have ingested it, but uh, with some because of some issue or the other at your source and you have the same file come again or maybe the other day when uh, your pipeline wants to pick it up, maybe with the same name but the same data. Like, uh, did you face any such scenarios like simply put in like any duplication of data, like how are you handling it while you're ingesting? Okay, to just so, avoid any yeah so we we kind of uh, have a uh, monitoring tables within the within the datas where in case of success it just mark those right batch as success even if the same file repeats or uh, even if duplicate happens we it will not let it happen because uh, because we are already marking it to uh, success so in the nifi as well we have certain processes where uh, it tries to you know it will just uh, it will try to try to uh, complete the transaction. You will only put it when the entire transaction is complete, otherwise it will revert it. So yeah, we use certain monitoring tables to check if the duplicates are there or not. And if it is there, we'll not use it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In Databricks, we have the inbuilt features of Databricks, uh, which uh, which is like uh, these uh, data architecture on the, the Databricks, where uh, where we have uh, asset properties, the, 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 pro the issue which we talked about. Uh, it's in it's inbuilt and it is handled directly by data. Yeah, but on prem we need to do certain monitor mm -hmm. monitoring tables for yeah. Okay, so in the same terms, uh, I just want to uh, ask few more questions. So, uh, so in your entire data pipeline, either it's ingestion process or after you are processing, you are serving your downstream team. Like in in the in the entire pipeline, are you uh? Do you have any uh, steps uh, to check the quality of the data or like so that you just avoid obvious uh, error scenarios so that either if something happens, you might uh, uh, give a notification to your uh, source, source team or maybe your uh, destination downstream so that they are aware of to avoid such cases. Any, any scenarios or anything? Yeah, so we have certain uh, certain inbuilt features like uh, in the like first of all the invalid data. Uh, so one thing is the obvious validations which we make uh, during our pipelines, like filling the null values or okay, removing the null values, whatever is the basis requirement. That's one thing. The second thing is the monitoring services. So whenever a Spark job is triggered in the within the NIFA as well, uh, we tend to. Uh, if there is a failure uh, during a Spark job, we tend to send out an email to the teams, uh, an email, and also that using the web hooks or the team certification to to tell the admin team, okay, that this particular job has failed. Uh, please check. Then we can uh, then the admin team generally go into the Spark UI and check what exactly happened, why it failed, and if it is failed during the ingestion processes, uh, there also the logs are checked. So patch and IFR, like the ingestion tools has the those logs. Uh, where uh, where we can check it. Same case with the so data factory. We we have the failures with the related to the Databricks notebooks. If a failure comes, we will call a API, an API, which would uh, inherently send out an email to the specific business user or uh, or the developer team or the IT team. This would happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, uh, getting back to a little bit on a Spark. So can you like uh, discuss about uh, the la uh, lazy evaluation in Spark, like maybe something practically you have seen or you have leveraged that particular uh, feature of uh, feature in Spark? Or yeah, so it's uh, quite important to, uh, in terms of optimizations and in terms of processing. So let's say we are reading a certain PO data and uh, we want to, the, there's a condition okay we want to include only the PO from a certain vendor, let's say HP or Dell. So let's say we are just reading that data and we just want to have a data from HP and Dell and we are filtering it out later. Okay, now the lazy evaluation is really helpful because if it is not there, then in the very first go while reading the data, we would have read all the data and uh, and then the later in the later stages of filtering, uh, we, we are going to remove that data. So if 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 Spark is creating a lineage or this lineage of task, and if it is uh, now Spark intelligently knows that okay, these filters are going to happen. Or for example, we are just picking three three columns from a certain data. Uh, Spark Spark already knows okay that later we are going to use three three columns only or a certain data only. So it will just uh, just uh, just pick that particular data during the initial read only. If it if it was happening command by command then it would have read all the data at very first go and in the late second stage it would remove the data so unnecessary data movement is 
is not required and it's of course not good for the memory. Okay. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, just uh, going on your point of unnecessary data movement. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, can you talk about like the concept of caching and persist in Spark? Like uh, how can it help us uh, to optimize a job or like in general? Yeah, so, so basically like uh, caching is something like uh, to, if we have, uh, if we are using the same data frames again and again, uh, we just store it in our local memory instead of uh, going to the disk, uh, disk back. So you can hold, store all the data to the to the local memory, they cache it and store it. Uh, and then use the use the cache for doing our processing. So if the same data frame is, uh, re, is reused again and again, we should be we, we to use caching. But that's quite, uh, it's, it's important to understand the memory terms of it. We should not store unnecessary data because we'll store directly in the memory. So yeah, that, uh, that we do. Okay, and when it comes to persist, did you? Yeah. Use so that? Uh, not much persist, but basically, like it's uh, if we want our data stored in a certain way, we can use the persist or persist operation. Like whether we just want to store it in the memory, whether we want to use the disk space as well. So in the persist, similar to the cache, but in persist, we can give explicit options where we want to store the data, whether this data needs to be serialized or not. And like the number of replicas, uh, which we want to give. So that gives an additional flexibility in terms of, uh, in terms of storing it, yeah. Um, so yeah, if we go to some basics in Spark, right? Uh, can you uh, talk about like different modes we have in Spark and like when we, when we use what and what is the common mode we use in general in a production system? So, okay. like, uh, mode is in during Spark submit mode, like deployment. Yes. Mode. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so basically, there are two modes. So one is client, and one is clustered. So, in uh, the we in the predictions, we always tend to go to the cluster mode. While development, we use client mode. And the reason being is simple. Like uh, this cluster mode, whenever we are starting is the cluster mode, the driver node is selected one of like from one of the worker nodes. And in the client point, the driver node driver node is selected as gateway node uh, where we can run our program. So during development, it's good uh, while we are seeing that we, we are debugging it. So it's good. In prediction, we we use cluster mode. Uh, only difference is driver will run in one of the uh, one of the workers mm -hmm. or the executors. Mm -hmm. So uh, are you uh, familiar with this user-defined functions uh, we kind of sometimes try to use in Spark yeah. and uh, mostly we try to avoid it, but why? I just want to know like, what, is it useful or it is not? If it's not like, why not we? I'm not sure much, but what I know is uh, uh, like UDF we use it, uh, UDF we need to avoid it. But uh, like uh, since Spark internally has different optimizations techniques with their its certain functions, uh, it's always good to use Spark original functions. And if we need it, uh, yeah, we can write the UDF. So we just need to write, uh, let's say, writing it in Python. I just need to write a normal Python program, register this as a UDF, and directly use it uh, within within any Spark select command or a with Python command. So yeah, we can do that. I am not sure the exact reason why we should not use it, but what I can think of is maybe the Spark in general had various optimizations within its own function. So yeah, it's always good to use it. Yeah. So in the same terms, uh, did you uh, like explore about this AQE, the adaptive query execution? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's okay, what, really can, you, can you talk about it a little? What yeah, so, it like? How does it help us? So AQA, help, AQA basically came after Spark 3.2, and it helps us in various tasks. Like uh, one of the one of the tasks, one of the very important thing is to handle the partition skew. So it handles the patch partition skew, skew by default. Other than that, we have to use we have to do remove the partition skew by manually removing certain like by using certain techniques like salting. Uh, that one of the tasks which it just does. Uh, the second one which i am aware about is like uh, giving this uh, by default shuffle partition which we have uh, the by transformations we have 200 so even if there are only 10 different distinct keys within a certain good by functions it will tend to create the 200 partitions it, uh, the aq will remove it and the third thing is uh, basically like uh, in certain cases uh, while performing uh, joins it also can also help us even if the 
a broadcast giants are set while shuffling let's say the broad, the positive broadcast giant is there uh, then it will uh, it will help us in achieving that as well uh, which would not be possible because if if let's say without shuffling the uh, second table data is more than the broadcast limit which is that by 10 mb and during the internal mm -hmm. shufflings the data becomes less than 10 mb then yeah it's really it helps us to avoid shuffling as well in a way mm -hmm. by applying the broadcast rates Okay. Uh, yeah. While you're talking about AQE, you added so a bit sorting and all, right? So, right. did you ever face like in, in your like uh, this experience uh, about like small file problem and uh, what is the scenario when you faced it if, if if you have and like how did you? Okay. So, so basically, this small uh, small file problem uh, which we we faced within the database. Uh, so, it's, it's thing is key. Let's say we. A small small file, small single single record or a small small record data are multiple. I'll return in a data lake. Now the thing will happen is uh, small files will be returned, and when we are going trying to read it, uh, Spark has to open a file, close it again, open or close it, open open and close, and it will create a lot of issues. With not issues, but in terms of time, it will take a lot of time. So because opening and closing will of course take a time. So it's always set to it's always uh, useful to basically merge the merge those files in a, in a single file maybe of one GP. So within the Databricks, we had this optimize command uh, that could be used. Which what it will do is it will just uh, merge all the files uh, to a to a to a big, little bigger file, and in that way that problem could be solved. So maybe uh, let's uh, try to. Uh, uh, Talk about the use case to design maybe an end-to-end -end, uh, data pipeline. Okay. So let's say like uh, we have some um, yeah we have uh, like we have some uh, health records or like some uh, some medical records of people from a uh, from a hospital or some uh, health health firm and all. So mm -hmm. I want to design uh, like you to, like talk about uh, the design of the pipeline so that you kind of first. Uh, Flow through all the pro all the layers of uh, uh, the pipeline, like ingestion, processing, or like uh, the consumption. Let's say I want to uh, take the data, read the data, and uh, at the end I want to ha have some analysis dashboard or like give it to downstream. There can be a couple of use cases downstream. So, like, how would a typical uh, design of a pipeline looks like, and uh, what are the things you should take care of in terms of uh, different aspects like quality, governance, or uh, Different other uh, data aspects we have to be uh, sure about while while designing it. Okay, so if we are reading a different kind of health records, so first we have to uh, ensure uh, certain things like uh, we want let's say let's say health records are coming from different different organizations or different different customers. Now uh, we want to build a data pipeline so that for a specific type of sources. Uh, only a single code is written or a single pipeline is built uh, so that even if the new customers are uh, added, we don't have to, you know, again, modify the code. So we can uh, we can have a configuration, some kind of configuration files uh, where while consuming the data, we can just set the configurations. Uh, like, uh, let's say we are having uh, different APIs uh, calling uh, for getting the different data. So we can, we can just put out a configuration file while triggering, it will read whatever APIs are available within the configuration file and get that data from those APIs. Similar, if we are having a having a databases, so we can just list down the different different databases which we are going to use within the configuration and get that data from the from the from the from the databases. So that uh, that that we have to ensure that okay, we are we are doing it in a common way so that it could be could be used uh, from very, for various customers and we don't have to write the patterns again and again. That's the one aspect of it while reading the data. Now while reading, uh, let's say we want to remove certain kind of data which we do like which are invalid or which we doesn't need to be computed by the uh, by this by the target systems. So we have to ensure that we are removing it. Uh, and uh, if it is ingestion layer, if it is totally invalid data uh like certain customers which we don't support at all within certain customers certain with certain records which you don't want to which you don't want to even have it in our databases we would re remove them and then we will push the data whatever data is there we'll push it to the data lake 
this is first step uh, while ingestion also we can uh, set up the monitoring tables we just have a record which event came uh, which is successfully loaded to the data lake uh, which event failed and if it failed at what step it is failing while removing the invalid data it is failing while reading the configuration file it is failing or while data source itself it is failing so we can have certain kind of aspects and we can just have store them in using the monitoring tables uh, after that, when the data is stored, all the raw data is stored in the data lake, uh, we can again put the, read the data from uh, like using this path pipelines. And there also, if the multiple joins are there, if the multiple, uh, multiple joins are there, we should, we should tend to use uh, the optimizations which are just like the SMB joins. Uh, there are also like a filtering, let's say some of the requests we wanted to keep it in the raw data because of a lighter purpose, but while analytics, we don't want it. So we should remove that data and uh, and put that data in a way uh, like where the data warehousing teams or the modeling teams can can actually make use of it. So from the data, data lakes for it, we'll read it. Uh, we may create a different directories uh, where we want to put it to an aggregated data, different for data warehousing, different for data modeling, data like the machine learning teams, uh, because both have different use cases. So we can just push that data back to those data lakes and then they can connect it. So yeah, we can have this uh, big pipeline uh, in this way. So uh, in, in this scenario, like we are handling uh, some people data over here and, uh, and also uh, when you are uh, talking about your project, uh, I think you might be also uh, dealing with some customer data, which might be some names or emails or uh, some related to uh, right. their personal aspects. Right. So, uh, in that scenario, do we have to take care that we are not exposing those uh, data out uh, in public, or like, uh, if if that is to be uh, like uh, um, governed or taken care well, uh, maybe doing some encryption, uh, like any anything that we have to follow around that, uh, so that we are following. Yeah. So we, if there are some very, uh, you know, like private data or something, we can use certain encrypting techniques. Uh, maybe removing certain numbers, like with a very basic removing certain number by asterisk, like we do it within the cards and all, credit cards and all. And we can just keep the last four numbers and uh, remove the, using the regular expressions within this bar, we can uh, we can actually just uh, hide that particular data. And if the encryption is needed, I'm not sure exactly how we can use the encryptions, but there are hash functions, certain hash functions available, certain encryptions available. Uh, within the Python as well. So definitely we can use it, encrypt the data, and uh, again, while writing it, to ensure that okay, we are not uh, exposing it to the teams. Yeah, uh, so before we continue, let's uh, go with some SQL questions. This is a SQL question in the chat. Uh, maybe if, uh, you can just open uh, any uh, Word document or not. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it. Uh, okay. Uh, you can go through the question once. Uh, if you have any questions, like I can. Okay, so thank you, Calculate the community sum of activities found for each user over time. Okay, so for each date, uh, we have to uh, we have to count to. Uh, Okay, I'll uh, maybe uh, make it simple, like, uh, maybe I'll uh, let you know the output, how it looks like. Let's say, uh, for, uh, yeah, I'll just explain you over here only. If you look at the sample, right, uh, mm -hmm. sample data. So, I, I want to see something like, uh, let's say, for uh, at, uh, user ID 1, right? Mm -hmm. So, and for activity post, he posted uh, only uh, twice. So, the activity count is 2. So when when we go to the next day, which is the second, uh, he he commented twice. Mm -hmm. So the cumulative counts are like he posted only twice. So for each activity type, the cumulative count is uh, two. For post, for comment, it's three. But when it comes to user ID two, uh, at uh, on first he posted five times. But when it comes to second, he posted one more time. So the cumulative count will be five plus one six for the activity type post. Okay. And uh, for like for the second user, it's ten only because there is no more uh, to add. You add up and have a cumulative count, right? So that's what I'm expecting. Uh, you can uh, 
not necessarily like we can discuss first uh, what's your thought about this and uh, we can jump into writing query sure so yeah i think uh, okay i think i can uh, i can do that uh, i can pop okay. your video call so uh, okay just one question on this mm -hmm. in the final output uh, okay we need all the fields uh, and we need to uh, one more field right the cumulative yes. one correct yes it is a window function on the user id i think yeah this will give us the result Okay. Um, can you explain me, like? Uh, yeah. So basically, this one is just to select it, and this sum mm -hmm. is a window function which we are using, uh, which is just to find a certain data within a certain window. So and within this uh, sum, we wanted to make a sum of activity count, and uh -huh. we wanted to now we are defining the window size here. So we wanted to partition by user ID making it. So for each user ID uh, and for each activity, for the combination of this, it will keep up the sum. So it will keep up like uh, this uh, for one and two. Uh, it would just take this two uh, and let's say for this one, for two and four for the combination of this, it will just keep five. Then again, two and four will come. So it will make a sum of six. Mm -hmm. So for two and four, the cumulative count will come as six. But now this combination is different. This two and like. So it will just keep that count as ten only. Um. So, um, did you uh, did you come across or hear about the concept of idempotency? We generally talk about whenever we deal with data, right? So, um, did you heard about it? Like, yes, yes. Like, what is it like, and why we, and which scenarios we want to make sure or we consider that concept. So I missed the last line. I heard adjuvancy is after that. Uh, after that, uh, I I kind of uh, missed. Uh, can you please repeat? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm just asking. Like uh, we talk about item potency when we deal with data, right? So okay. what is that? And uh, like in which scenarios we really take care of that concept uh, to be followed? And uh, did you did you try to like do that in any of your use cases or projects? For item potency, uh, maybe I've used it. I'm not recalling it. What exactly item potency is? Uh, if you can explain mm -hmm. me that, I can. I might be able to. I'll show you an example or something. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, like when we kind of uh, like we have like basically in failure scenarios, right? If we want to rerun a step, right? We we shouldn't be uh, like we should take care that we are not uh, inserting duplicate data or we are not creating some duplicacy, right? So we okay. should take care uh, of that, right? So did you, uh, basically, maybe if, if I have to frame it uh, in another way or in a generalized way, like uh, how do you handle failures in your pipelines, maybe? Okay, so so we always tend to set a, a, a failure uh, within the data pipeline. If we are building it in a data factory, we tend to set up a failure section and call an API or something to just uh, get the error details that's the one thing which we do and talking about this uh, duplicate thing uh, we we basically we basically use certain techniques so within data breaks we have uh, within data breaks we have uh, can i stop sharing yeah okay so we within within data breaks we have uh, uh, we have the concept of like uh, certain certain things like uh, using the copy commands or uh, Within the SQL functions, uh, we can we can update if if, if we can only we will only update if it is if the order ID is not there or uh, if we want to update it we can we can use it. So I haven't used it much uh, uh, in much deal better much uh, larger manner, but in some cases yeah. the idea is basically to have a failures emails or a key note or the notification whenever. Uh, Whenever such, such kind of things happens, and based on the user requirements, if it's a uh, updation or uh, we can we can handle it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, so, any uh, you any scenarios uh, where you have faced uh, this out of memory exception with Spark, and if you have, uh, like, uh, what is the use case, and uh, how did you find out that? That is because of this particular issue and how. So these out of memory issues mainly happen with, in our case, in in the in cases of 
what I do, like partition skew, right? Uh, where uh, where a certain keys is having a large amount of data, and the other unique keys are not having that much data. Then in those cases, the auto memory can happen. That's one thing. The second thing is uh, is the, basically the driver memory. So we set the driver memory initially, well, uh, like we did the configuration. So if we perform certain things like uh, which is to show or to have a count and uh, and to like in the broadcast and if we are broadcasting a lot of data since it's the driver task to broadcast uh, to different machines so it can uh, it can lead to out of memory errors and that is mainly seen by uh, in the spark ui so in the spark ui you can see which data spill happened whether uh, whether any data spill happened or not uh, in case of whether the file the a particular task is failed or not and in those cases finally enabling the uh, aqe like to handle the partition queue or to basically uh, like uh, increasing the driver memory in some cases or avoiding those things which uh, which has caused these issues uh, we can yeah we did that okay so how do yeah. you resolve it like uh, just uh, increasing the memory is it uh, not exactly increasing memory by optimizing the codes as well like uh, let's say let's say the default broadcast and size was greater than and greater than the than the driver memory so we tend to you know either do a we can do a patch we did a patching and bucketing instead of doing the broadcast joints in mm -hmm. case of out of memory for the drivers and for uh, for the partition scheme yeah we enable the aqa mainly okay um so uh, as we talked about memory right so yeah. can you uh, uh, discuss about like uh, what is an executor memory in spark and uh, uh, how we tune it and while we are uh, submitting a job or like how do we configure it and how it will be helpful uh, for a better execution yeah so execution memory is basically like uh, the memory which we allot like to a, to a certain executor to process the job and we we do it based on uh, what, what how much data we have, how many nodes we are have we are having, and how much time how much time do we want to process that uh, process that particular data. So let's say we have a hundred GB data now, and hundred GB data would be having around eight hundred uh, partitions. And uh, let's say let's say we we are having the four hundred cores to handle all that partition. So, so basically, what we tend to do is, in general, uh, we tend to give, uh, uh, let's say, we are using a, uh, how we can say, sixteen, uh, like a sixteen core, sixty four GB particular node. Okay. Now, in in that case, uh, in that case, if we do the calculation, uh, we like for each core, for each executor, if we assign five cores, then uh, then it will be divided into these three executors. So, whole node will be having three executor and uh, and the approximate which uh, which a particular executor will get around is 4 gb and in that 4 gb also we have a reserve memory and we define like we divide further divide that into the execution final execution memory and storage memory so idea is basically like for a for a single partition if it is of having 120 mb we're trying to assign uh, assign it approximately 1 gb because because as we discussed initially, the parquet files might have certain compression techniques, while in the memory it might increase, and uh, so that we tend to use those that much execution memory. Also, uh, since the certain executor, let's say we are having a four GB uh, memory, and these are div divided in a way so that the one GB will go to storage memory and one GB will go to execution memories. So we always uh, is that we always we need to check whether uh, we are not. Uh, over uh, caching the certain table so that it doesn't uh, exceed the storage memory which we have given otherwise the disk spill will happen and even if we if we are not using the storage memories then the partition which we with the execution memory which we talked about it can even even if the there are certain things certain things which which needed more execution then the execution memory can consume some kind of storage memory as well. So given these circumstances, taking care of these circumstances, we decide the memory. Uh, so uh, while we were discussing a design problem on the healthcare system, right? Uh, you right. mentioned about uh, SMB joins. 
Hmm. So, did you practically use that particular join and uh, what is the scenario? Can you explain what is an SMB join and also like uh, in which scenario we tend to use it and how how it will help us? Yeah. So, let's say we have this healthcare data where uh, for a certain customer, a uh, certain health record is linked, uh, and uh, so let's say uh, let's say certain customer, certain health record is linked. And both the tables which which are linked are having a large data, and we want to do it join. Then uh, using the SMB joins, we can reduce the overall shuffling. So what we do in that join is we basically we basically uh, div partition it while uh, while write while writing the data back to the hive tables. Uh, we partition and bucket uh, and tend to do the like partition on the C partitions on the join column. And bucketing also the same, like uh, the same number, same we tend to bucket in same number of uh, buckets, and then uh, then the join the join will happen in a way so that the same bucket data uh, is available is available within the same partition, and then the shuffling will be uh, will be less basically because the same bucket data is there in the same partition. Yeah. Okay. Uh... So, like we talked about different other aspects and optimizations in Spark, right? So, uh, in your perspective, what is the most challenging uh, issue that was raised, which uh, uh, that you solved, which you feel proud of, or like that you have learned something, uh, something related to that? Like, yeah. So, more challenging is the, is have like handling the larger larger data or uh, optimizing the pipelines whenever a failure occurred. Uh, within the uh, within the pipelines to check to to see what's happening and uh, to to see whether partition queues are happening or not. So basically, it's on more and more optimization, which uh, the challenges which we have faced and yeah, we have solved. Yeah. Uh, I have one uh, uh, simple DSA question. Yeah. Uh, before we go. Yeah, uh, so let's say we have uh, some list of strings, uh, mm -hmm. as I added in the chat. Uh, I, I just want you to find the longest uh, common substring or, or longest common substring of, uh, in the list of strings. If you can okay. uh, just talk about it first. We can go with the simple... So, so okay, so uh, we want to find the longest substring, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Or simply uh, to keep it simple, maybe the longest uh, prefix, common prefix. Okay. So uh, we, we can uh, uh, we can just have a uh, in this case, if you want to find a longest common substring, we can just have a pointer. Uh, like uh, we can just run a for loop on on the on the on this uh, on the entire substring. And within that for loop, uh, we can uh, uh, we can check uh, we can check basically like uh, uh, we can check uh, for each if the if all the prefix is common, then we'll just add it in our list. If all the prefix are common, and if if they are common, then we'll just add it in our list, and then we will move it to the second pointer. And in the second pointer also, we'll see if all the characters are common. So let's say with the uh, this in this case, this AAA will be common, so we'll just add it in in a different string. Uh, this PPP is common, we'll just add it in different string. Similarly, we will having we'll be having this P with we'll just add it in different string. In this case, uh, this particular uh, particular uh, length uh, is uh, is reached, so we'll just uh, do a break statement and whatever uh, string which we have written. That should be the final output. So in this case, the APP would be the final output. Okay. Uh, yeah. Maybe can can you write just the just the core logic over here? Yeah, I can. So just assume uh, you you have a you have that list of strings in in some variable. Okay. So so let's say we have this data where we are having the list of this. Okay. My screen is visible, right? Yes. Yes. Your screen is visible. Okay, so maybe we can just find the, the first we need to know what is the uh, minimum length for uh, for this so we can uh, do is we can uh, 
don't worry about the syntax or any okay it is uh, too much uh, just uh, but that's okay you can just uh, write us into it okay so you'll just have to use your next i in range of let's say we have this at this min length so for each i in range each i in range of min length for each i in range of min length just a minute even if you just want to write in any pseudo code kind of a perspective don't worry about the variables and stuff you can go ahead yeah you can do something like this uh, mm -hmm. where we are just to do it yeah yeah I think I get your idea. Uh, okay. That's okay. Cool. Uh, so, and uh, you can sh stop sharing your screen. Um, sure. Thank you. Uh, I just uh, have uh, one uh, uh, last question. So, uh, so in, in, in designing data pipelines, right, uh, yeah. in your current project or in your previous one, uh, are there any uh, considerations or uh, scenarios you have uh, discussed so that uh, in terms of uh, uh, scalability or like in, in terms of like failure handling scenarios like uh, any such considerations while designing in, in not in terms of uh, what technologies and what in I'm not talking about the low level design like high level uh, any such considerations you have you might have discussed uh, that you so considerations are or uh, basically uh, to 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 have a common, as I discussed before, to have a common pipelines for all the data, to have a very strict, like uh, the, in the, what we are storing it in the data lake, what we are storing it in the transaction system, to be very specific of the kind of data. And, uh, and uh, like, uh, if there is a reporting data needs to be done, then we are storing that data to the data warehouse. If, uh, if for the, the reporting data that needs to be in the data warehouse if the raw data needs to be stored it needs to be done in the data lakes so yeah that kind of considerations we did okay uh, sure uh, i think uh, we are good akash uh, okay, thank well. you uh, thanks a lot mm -hmm.